Hi, welcome to our podcast today. This is a special one. I'm Mary Abazia with Impact Planning Group, and I have Tom Spitali and Sean Wellam. And uh, we just, you know, we appreciate our business. We appreciate working with clients and um, and really looking at stories through the marketing lens. And so we thought this would be a really interesting way to close out 2022 is to talk about some of our favorite stories. Some of them went well, some of them didn't, but there's always lessons that we learned from it and that we think some of our clients did. And it's a nice way then to kick off for some learnings for 2023. So uh, with that, Tom, why don't you uh, share your favorite story of 2022? Yes, Mary gave us the assignment of looking at everything we talked about in the past year and picking <laughs> one um, that that hit a you know ticked a lot of boxes that we each thought was interesting. Mine uh, goes all the way back, at least the happening of this particular event that I want to talk about was in January of this year. So going all the way back to the beginning of the year, although I think we probably talked about it in the middle of the year. It's about um, Netflix and what happened to Netflix when they took what seemed to be like a reasonable price increase back in January and just got absolutely blasted with subscriber loss and subsequently with 50 some billion dollars worth of market cap loss to their stock price, simply from uh, raising their prices, which I think the price was a dollar or two on their monthly membership. And I thought this was really fascinating um, because it, it had elements of like uh, post COVID strategy. <laughs> um, you know, there was obviously some, I don't know, some inflationary aspects to this story. There was some life cycle aspects of this story. But at the end of the day, I, th I thought it was interesting that the three of us felt like what really happened to Netflix is that they totally got fooled by the pandemic that during the pandemic they felt like you know their subscriber growth and everything that was happening was indicative of just being in a real fast growth stage still in their marketplace in the pandemic with everybody kind of coming back into the home and not leaving the home and and looking for entertainment options this really fooled them and then when we started to come out of the pandemic and they went pretty confidently with this, their price increase. They found out that, uh-oh, we're not really in this growth phase. We're in a more mature phase of our market. There's a lot of new competitors here. Um, and frankly, you know, that they discovered themselves to probably be a lot less differentiated than they really were. And a lot of people just dropped it. They just dropped the, the the membership. They had stuff queued up on Hulu and all of the other, you know, uh, 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 different streaming services that they they might have uh, subscribed to. And uh, it was a real it was a real lesson on staying on top of, um, you know, where you are in your marketing uh, life cycle, your product life cycle, staying on top of where you are in terms of your differentiation versus competitors. And frankly, the idea, the lesson to really dig deeper than face value uh, in terms of what's going on with your metrics and at, you know asking those deeper questions of what's really going on so that um, you, know, you don't get surprised like this. So that was my favorite story of the year. Yeah, I wanna contrast your story with one that went well, because I think that's such a good bad story, you know, that um, Amazon um, a month later, in February, they announced that they were going to raise their annual fees. And I think the differences are that, and, and by the way, it was $119 to $139, so $20. Um, and they hadn't given a price increase in several years, since 2018. So, um, but I think that we, we believe in the communicate or create, communicate, and then capture. And they followed that rule much better you know they they already were talking about all the things that they were providing for example they were going to do in um, metro areas they were going to have same day delivery um they were investing in oh exclusive thursday night football uh free shipping um to on more items and then they had um in their in their um movie department they had the wheel of time jack reacher and lord of rings 
that they were bringing out. So, you know, you just look at this list of all the stuff that they were going to bring to you and it, it's only $20. So unlike Netflix, they communicated so much value before saying, by the way, we, we're going to raise this price a little bit on you. And they captured it and they didn't lose any business. We're still all using Amazon. So um and they probably are at a different life stage i i think it's so interesting about that that um we've we've asked a lot of people in our workshops if anybody's heard anybody complain even complain about amazon prime's price increase i don't think there has been one person that has raised their hand and said that not only did none of them complain about it or none of us complain about it they haven't heard that anybody else complained about it. It must be that Thursday night football, Mary, your favorite part of the Amazon Prime package. Well, I think that's key though, because a lot of what Amazon offer, I mean, Prime was originally just free shipping, right? That was that was the genesis of Prime. You you were a Prime member and your stuff got got delivered with no incremental cost. And if you bought enough stuff, it it paid for itself. And and they've added on the entertainment. The sports, they they offer Premier League football over here, which is a pretty expensive ticket to buy. They had to spend a lot of money to get the rights to a few games. But they stream some Premier League soccer matches. And I think it's that that diversity and the fact that it's wrapped up in this very familiar business that we all use or, or many of us use for buying lots of odds and ends. It, it, the Amazon delivery is, is a regular feature that comes to your doorstep or to your house every every week and maybe several times a week. That diversity and that dependence and that multiple value points just makes it such a an easier proposition to defend and to develop as opposed to a more of a one-stop shop that's also subject to a lot of competition. There's this huge differences to learn from, uh, from yes. both of those examples. So who's your favorite story, Sean? Well, mine's more of a a bigger picture thing rather than a, a firm specific. It's the way that we've all adapted and changed in particular with remote working, working away from the office and having meetings virtually rather than in person. Obviously this came about in 2020 when the, the pandemic hit and, and through the, the 2020 into 21, we started to get used to being on, uh, on conference calls in front of cameras and we adapted our business model us in particular we used to do a lot of classroom work and for a while there we did no classroom work and all the classes were online but we evolved and developed and we created better ways of sharing content and more interactive ways of sharing content yes we gave some stuff up i think all of us would still prefer the face-to-face -face, that intimacy you get with when you're with people but it's not such a game changer that you can't have some meetings without that personal interaction. And we adapt. And it's not just for people like us who, who hold seminars and workshops. Sales calls changed. Initial sales calls that can happen online as opposed to requiring lots of travel and time commitment. The fact that we can tailor presentations and create our positioning in ways that that are designed to appear on a screen we can make use of things such as video and interactive presentations we can invite people to the calls for short term we can say i'll get our product guy in for 10 minutes on this call i'll get engineering to come in and talk about this i'll get customer you can't bring all these people with you to a sales call traditionally when you do it virtually, you can you can tap in and say, let's just bring engineering in for that point, or let's bring uh, customer service in. We can record with permission, and with that, we get insights that we can revisit meetings and, and not have to rely on memory so much. There's basically a ton of changes that are very positive that will enable sales and marketing to collaborate, to be part of the same customer experience and, and exchange, and... And just more broadly, we are getting so much smarter at, at, at this hybrid model of sometimes being face to face, sometimes being remotely, and we're all a lot more comfortable with it. And I think the, the productivity and the innovation potential from this change is huge. That's my, that's my favorite story over the past year. The, Sean, the when, when, we, 
when we first talked about this, and you know, we're talking about si Pfizer reducing their sales force despite record sales due to the COVID-19 vaccine, we thought we thought that was significant. And we made a prediction at that point that it would be this 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 whole move to virtual would be a catalyst for sales and marketing to work better together. Are we seeing it? Mm -hmm. Are you guys seeing it? Absolutely. You know, the, the fact that that it's removed the sense of mystery because it allows people to see into each other's world. In particular, it allows marketing to get more involved in, in customer interactions. Marketing should be the spokesperson for the customer, the, the advocate for the customer within a business typically, uh, or at least representing the customer's views when it comes to product development or, or, or pricing models or whatever it is. The fact that they can get more directly involved with with the sales, with the customers, with what really happens is a huge powerful. And I've seen lots of people where that is exactly what's happening. They're either jumping onto sales calls, reviewing sales calls, or having the opportunity to interact with customers without the expense of traveling to multiple sites. And I think that has just taken away some of the mystery and that's why that's how i see it working and not enough people are doing it i have to say it's a, i think it's a huge potential improvement for lots of businesses out there to 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 marry those things together sales and marketing and this new virtual world that we live in has huge potential but yeah i'm seeing and like, and like you said sean you know bringing down the cost right now with the you know the inflation has just you know we watched it become a mountain over the year and companies are struggling to bring costs down and keep customers happy. And this is one of the ways that, like you said, it really does optimize the relationship and it helps the, the margins. Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, so different models, business models through the year. One of the ones that we thought was quite interesting is Apple. They um, now subscription is not new. You know, we it's been around. But it's interesting that Apple chose to um, start to come out with a subscription model because the innovation was slowing. People, instead of buying a new phone every two years, it was delaying to three years. So they could see their trends were, they were in trouble. And so as a way to uh, address that, and they didn't have any innovations to, to step people up, they, um, they took a marketing approach to, you know, we're gonna give you a subscription offer which was kind of cool because it um, it allowed people to continue like a car to have the newest models and the old ones that they would take back, they could repurpose and make money on that as well. Mm -hmm. So they locked people into the franchise um, and they also did an Apple pay later, which was another element of marketing. They had credit cards, but then they brought in that financial element. So two really cool things, but, but it's because they, had to change their business model to really stay on top of things. Yeah. I think it's, a, a, and we continue to see more, more and more of this idea of how can you sort of productize, even if you have a service, how can you productize it and turn it into, you know, a monthly subscription where people kind of get in the habit of consuming it on a regular basis? I mean, we're even thinking about that for our own business, but, but also, I, how, I, won't how reveal, been... I don't reveal what. You can, the later uh, also, podcast. Also, how how you can reflect on what what customers really care about. Also, in the in the the, the phone space, there's one of the uh, providers over here, one of the the network providers who obviously they use different devices, Apple and Samsung and so forth. But they just made an offer, which was it's not always right to change, not right for you to change your phone so frequently because of the cost constraints in the world we're at at the moment. And offering this this health check process, we say we'll check your phone if it's two years old. I need that and give you an idea of you know <laughs> of its of its battery health and so forth, almost encouraging you or giving you the option to stay with the phone, which is what people were doing anyway. But now you make it into a positive, and it's how a lot of those models are changing, and and the need to smooth the the the, the peaks and troughs of owning a, a, an asset like Apple are doing with subscription. And maybe even sometimes just saying, hey, maybe you don't want to change all the time and finding a different way and, and adapting to the consumer's changing world is also an important trend that I think we'll just see more of, particularly as inflation is going to be with us for the next 12 months at least. Yeah. 
I think the biggest story of the year, though, the absolute biggest story, I finally changed my background. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was going to make my top three. I just didn't want to... Uh... I the problem was, was actually... Mary gave Mary gave it to me. So I was like, here, change your background. How many years <laughs> of podcast have you had the same background? <laughs> yeah, it's time to. Um, so any closing thoughts? I'm gonna close this out. That besides was my, Tom's background. <laughs> that was my closing thought of the year. I, mean, I, wanted, the to end, I well. wanted to end the year big. <laughs> I, I I I just say that this has been a momentous year for for change. Yet so many things remain the same. And as ever, we don't know what's around the corner. But those businesses that are that are ready to look to the future with a with an optimism and and with a plan and with with a a, a structured way of thinking will always find opportunity. So so here's to another twelve months of growth and and roller coaster. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah, we wish you the very best and um, we look forward to seeing you in 2023. Thank you very much. Thank you.